this in light of 15 times. Welcome to the coolest, pippest half hour of fun on TV. This is Brain Stew with Jennifer Pulley. Have you got your VCR fired up and ready to tape? If not, grab a pen and paper because we are opening the Brain Stew vault to dig up some of our best experiments from past shows. Yeah, yeah, I remember that one. Yeah, oh, oh, that one, that was great. That was really cool. Stick around. Brain Stew is next. Hey, all you brain stewers out there. Welcome to the show. This week, we're giving you a brain stew best of show. What? <laughs> a best of show. We here at Brain Stew have taken the best experiments performed by kids just like you and put them all into one show. Cool. That's what we say. Anyway, all these experiments we're doing, they come from past brain stew episodes. You know, we tried to fit them all in, but we couldn't. Oh, yeah, I got it. <coughs> <coughs> Sorry, you guys, I just, just coughed up a lung here. Well, you know, time's a-wasting. Time's a-wasting. Let's get going. This guy's looking a little thin. He's missing a lung. I just coughed up one. Let's get rolling. You got your science gear on? Um, yeah. Let's open the Brain Stew Vault and check out our first experiment. We did a show on the history of flight. We visited Kitty Hawk, North Carolina, and learned how Orville and Wilbur Wright, better known as the Wright Brothers, got a heavier-than-air machine to actually lift off the ground. Yo, speaking of lift, my friend Gary performed a simple but awesome experiment on lift using only two objects. You gotta try this. Get off of me. Wilbur and Orville came to Kitty Hawk, North Carolina, because there was plenty of space and a constant wind. This magical experiment will show us how airspeed, like wind, affects flight. And you only need two things, a funnel and a ping pong ball. This may look like a soccer ball, but it is a ping pong ball. Follow me. Turn the funnel upside down. Hold the ping pong ball in the funnel with your finger. Next, take a deep breath and blow into the narrow end of the funnel. Then remove your finger from the ball as you continue to blow. Got it? Now try it with me. Did you see that? The ball floated inside the funnel even though I blew out. Wow. Here's why the ball didn't fall out. The faster the air passes by the ball, the less pressure is put on the ball. The air pressure above the ball is less than the pressure under it. So the ball is held up by air. The pressure of moving air explains the upward lift on the wings of an aircraft. When the air flows faster over the top of the wing than below, there is an upward push called lift. That's how the Wright brothers were able to get their planes off the ground. Hey, thanks Gary for that awesome experiment. Gary, you're looking a little thin these days. You know, maybe you need a long after all that <gasps> breathing. <laughs> Speaking of flight, our next experiment comes from a show we did on birds of prey. Brain Stew took a trip to Bush Gardens Williamsburg, and we learned all about raptors. You know, vultures, hawks, eagles, and owls. Check out this experiment, performed by my friend Angela, and find out how animals hide from birds of prey. <laughs> How does the color of animals protect them from birds of prey? You know, like hawks, falcons, and vultures. I have no idea. Let's find out. Here's the deal. You need to do this experiment in your backyard or park. You need lots of room. This is what you need. Color pipe cleaners, any color you choose. You need four markers, string, a tape measure, and a friend. Here is the procedure. First, you take your markers and your measuring tape to mark off a 20-foot square. Next, you take your string and tie it around each of the markers so you can make a large box. Ta 
Greta. Ask an adult to cut 20 half inch pieces of each color. Next, I'm gonna take each of these pipe cleaners and place them evenly as I can in the box. You ask a friend to come in the box and find as many pieces as they possibly can in 20 seconds. Go! Stop! Good job, can I have those? As you can see, Lonnie didn't find all the colored pipe cleaners. Some colors are easier to find, others are very difficult. Why'd this happen? If the grass is the same shade of green as the color pieces, then it is difficult to tell the difference between the two. Colors that look alike were harder to find. Some of the darker color pieces blend in with the shadows of the grass. It is the same color blending that protects animals from predators like vultures, hawks, and falcons. For example, a green snake blends in very well on a lawn of green grass. This makes it difficult for birds of prey like the hawk to spot it. Woo, way to go, Angela! Yeah, go girl! She's such a super girl. Hey, ever visited a swamp? Brains you did. We visited the Great Dismal Swamp, and our brains grew as we were fed information on the unique ecosystem of a swamp and the different animals and plants that live in a swamp. Yo, Marie tried this experiment and got some colorful results. Why don't you? Ever wonder how plants and trees get their water? Let's do this experiment and find out. Here's what you need. Two glasses, red and blue co food coloring, scissors, tap water, a measuring cup, and one white carnation with a long stem, and an adult helper. Here's the procedure. Have an adult helper cut the stem in half lengthwise from the end to about halfway up toward the flower. Thank you. Now, pour half a cup of water into each glass. Now add enough food coloring to make each color in each glass a deep color. One red, one blue. Now put one stem in the blue water and the other in the red. Now, leave the flower just like this for 48 hours. Cool, check out these results. After 48 hours, the flower will have changed color. One side will be red and the other blue. I wonder why this happened. Tiny tubes called xylem run up the stalk to the flower petals. The colored water moves through the xylem, allowing the color to be spread throughout the cells in the petal, causing their color to change. Minerals in the swamp soil are carried to the plant cells, in this same way providing nutrients to the flowers and leaves. The minerals dissolve in water just like the red and blue food coloring did. The solution is carried up through the xylem from the plant's roots to the leaves and flowers and the rest of the plant. That's how plants get their water. Thanks, Marie. You know, that experiment, it also works with celery. Just use celery instead of a white carnation and check out what happens. Aw, what's the matter? You feeling crabby? Don't worry, Brains will be right back after this short break with an experiment on crabs and much, much more. So don't touch that remote. I'm watching. And we're back. Are you still feeling crabby? You know, I've been like that before. On one episode, Brain Stew was invited to the Virginia Marine Science Museum to learn about crabs and their kin. You know, blue crabs, hermit crabs, sand fiddler crabs, and the world's largest crab. Ooh, hang tight. You gotta try this experiment. Jordan, one of my past students, shows us how crabs hear. Wait a minute. Crabs don't have ears. Jordan? How do people and animals hear? Here's an easy experiment to show you how. All you need is a metal spoon and about two feet of kite string. Tie the handle of the spoon in the middle of the string.
Wrap the ends of the string around both of your index fingers. Like this. Oh, and make sure both strings are the same length. Next, put both of your index fingers in your ear. <coughs> Finally, lean over so the spoon hangs freely and tap it against the edge of your table. Wow, that sounds like a church bell. Hey, how did that happen? Let me tell you, the metal in the spoon starts to vibrate when struck. These vibrations are transmitted up the string to the ears. The ability to hear is due to one's ability to detect vibrations. Objects must vibrate to produce a sound. The vibrating object causes the air around it to move. Vibrating air molecules enter the ear and strike the eardrum, causing it to vibrate. These vibrations continue to travel through bones and fluids in the ear until they reach a nerve that sends a message to the brain. Although crabs do not have ears, they can still detect sounds caused by vibrations. Hollow hairs on the outside of their bodies pick up vibrations created by sounds or movement in the water. The animals also use the hairs for feeling, tasting, and smelling. You know, all this talk about crabs makes me hungry. I could go for uh... You know, all this talk about crabs makes me hungry. Mm. I could go for uh... Mm. Um, any ideas? I know, how about a homemade pizza? Hey, that's a great idea! Welcome to the Abrana Stool Kitchen. This week's experiment is to see if my friend Ryan here can teach us to make a healthy cheese and tomato pizza. I sure hope this works. That sounds yummy. Pizza. Okay, Ryan, how are we gonna do this? First, you need your mom and dad to get these ingredients. One teaspoon of dried meat. One teaspoon of sugar. Five ounces of whole wheat flour. Salt and pepper. Two teaspoons of vegetable oil. Two tablespoons of tomato sauce. Look, no salt added. One teaspoon of Italian seasoning. Three and a half ounces of mozzarella cheese. Two and a half ounces of warm water. Here's the recipe. Make sure you follow the directions carefully. Thanks, Jen. She's such a teacher. First, measure the warm water into the measuring cup. Look, it's two and a half fluid ounces. Now, pour the water into a bowl. Add one teaspoon of yeast and one teaspoon of sugar. Stir until the sugar has dissolved. Now leave a cup in a warm place for 15 minutes, just until the mixture gets frothy. I'm going to put mine outside. I don't care where you put yours as long as it's warm. Put five ounces of whole wheat flour into a large bowl. Add a little salt and mix it together. Make a little hole in the center of the flour. Put two teaspoons of oil into the center. Pour in the warm water mixture. Stir with a wooden spoon. With your hands, mold the dough into a ball. Knead the dough for five minutes. Put the dough on a pizza pan. Roll out the dough. Thanks. You're welcome. Let the dough rise in a warm place for about 30 minutes. Again, I'm going to take mine outside. Jennifer, preheat the oven to 425. You got it, Chef. Put two tablespoons of tomato sauce onto the pizza. And remember, no salt added. I'm gonna put a little more on, because I like a lot of sauce. Hey, Ryan, don't forget the Italian seasoning. Oh, okay. It looks like grass. 
finally we get to sprinkle some of the cheese on it. Well, here's the pizza, but it's not quite done yet. Jennifer, would you put it in the oven for me? Sure, it goes to 425, right? Yes. How long? 15 to 20 minutes. Anything you say, Chef. Brian, thank you so much for making us a healthful snack. I appreciate it. Dr. Babs would be very happy. She sure would be. You want to eat? Yeah, let's go. Mm. Oh, Ryan, you did an awesome job. This pizza is great. Well, you're gonna stick around and help me clean up the kitchen, right? Because we got a lot of stuff to do. There's flour everywhere. All right, Ryan? Yummy. Now I'm full. Thanks, Ryan. That experiment came from our show on health and fitness. We filled our stomach and our brain with food and fitness facts. So next time you reach for a cheese puff, remember, how nutritious is it really? Better go for that healthy pizza instead. Speaking of heart healthy food, did you know that your heart, like your body, needs exercise in order to stay in shape? Brain Stew talked to a cardiologist who pumped our brain with information on our heart and how it works. Know what happens to your heart when you exercise? You got me. Well then check out this experiment with my friend Jonathan. He and his heart are in good shape. Unlike uh, Mr. Bones here. How do you measure your heart rate? Let's find out. You need a watch with a second hand, paper and pencil, or a blackboard. To find your heart rate, put these two fingers on the right side of your neck, or the left side of your wrist. Count the number of heartbeats you feel in one minute. After a minute, my heart beat 84 times. Now they're gonna make me exercise. Okay. Now let me take my heart rate for a minute. After exercising, my heart beat 119 times. I always write, I always write like that. Here are the results. As you can see, my heart beat was slower when I was sitting and much faster when I was exercising. Why does this happen? The number of times your heart beats in one minute is called your heart rate. Adults have an average heart rate of about 70 beats per minute while sitting quietly. Children usually have a faster rate. The rate of both children and adults increases with activity. Strenuous activities such as running can cause the rate to be 150 times a minute. Each time the heart contracts, blood is forced through the arteries. The blood moves at a rhythmic rate, causing the arteries to pulsate or throb. The beat you feel with your fingertips is called your pulse. All blood vessels have this throbbing motion. So what are you waiting for? Go bug your parents and try some of these experiments at home. Why am I dressed like this? Up next, grab your hat, gloves, scarf, winter coat, because we're going to Antarctica. What? Yep, Antarctica. Plus, we'll see how the sun helps us keep time. I'll be back in a minute. Hey, we're back with the best of Brain Stew's experiment. Our next experiment comes from a show on navigation. We visited a United States Coast Guard station and filled our brain with how ships and aircraft navigate. I actually took a trip on a helicopter and witnessed a search and rescue mission. It was really cool. Anyway, one of my past students performed a cool experiment on navigation with the help of the sun. You gotta try this. Let's see how a clock can be used as a compass. First, we need to make a clock, so this is what you need. A piece of paper, a ruler, a pair of scissors, a needle, a magic marker, a compass, and a piece of cardboard. Oh yeah, you also need a watch. Thanks. <laughs> <laughs> 
First, cut a five inch diameter circle from the piece of paper. I have already drawn my circle. Cut it out. Using the magic marker, write the numbers as they appear on a clock. Ta-da! Remember that cardboard? Well, put your clock on it. Take your pen and stick it in the center of your clock. Oh, and don't poke yourself. Make sure your cardboard and your clock are in the sun. Turn the paper circle until the shadow of the pen falls on the correct time. My watch says it's 4.30. Oh, by the way, this experiment doesn't work if it's daylight saving time. Here are the results. Nor should be halfway between the number 12 and the shadow of your pen. Are you sure? Yes, and I have a compass to check. A compass always points north, and that is north, halfway between the number 12 and the shadow of the pen. Why does this happen? The compass clock I made is most accurate March 21st and September 23rd, when the sun rises in the east and sets in the west. On these dates, the shadow of the pin approaches due north as noon nears. Oh, bravo, Ryan, bravo. You know, he always knew what time it was in school. That's why I picked him, you know, it's like, Miss Polly, time to go to lunch. Miss Polly, time to go home. Oh yeah, I'll never forget that, Ryan. Always knew time. Ready for the big chill? Brain Stew took a trip to Antarctica. Well, by way of Nautica, the National Maritime Center in Norfolk, Virginia. We found out who discovered this icy continent, how cold it gets on Antarctica, and who lives there. Not me. This experiment will chill you to the bone. Okay, I'm gonna stump him, guys. I'm gonna stump him. Martin. Yes. If Antarctica is surrounded by the Atlantic Ocean, the Pacific Ocean, and the Indian Ocean, mm -hmm. and we all know that oceans are made of salt water. Right. Okay. How does the water in Antarctica freeze? That's a very good question, very good point. Normally, you don't think about ocean water freezing. Here in Virginia, here in Norfolk, we don't see the water freezing very often. It boils down, no pun intended, mm -hmm. to one main thing. It's just so cold down there. It's freezing down there. This is huge. This is an iceberg. It's made out of salt, salt water. Salt water and also fresh water. Here's the interesting thing about Antarctica. Antarctica has the largest supply of fresh water in the world. About 70% of the Earth's fresh water is locked up as ice, frozen water, frozen H2O. Now, the cool. interesting thing is that the land or the air up above the water is very, very cold. Water itself is actually warm, at least warm compared to the air. And I can show you this with an experiment. All right. So Jen, I'm going to go ahead and very carefully light this candle. That's why I have you here, to make sure that I'm using the matches properly. OK. And this is going to show us now that air is warmer than water. Exactly. I know, no, water is warmer than air. <laughs> right, right. Water is warmer than air. Okay. And also, the water is a lot better at absorbing heat or holding heat, which is why it is warmer. OK. So the first part of the experiment is going to be using my favorite toy in the whole wide world, which is a balloon. The balloon is filled with air. We're going to have you oh, no. hold the balloon over the candle. <laughs> what do you think is going to happen? I have a feeling it's going to pop. It's going to pop. And make a really loud noise. So I'm going to get to cover my ears because you're going to be holding the balloon. Okay, here we go, kids. Not fair at all. All right. So it did exactly what we expected it to do. Sure. Now for because the there next, was air in it. There was air in it, and air is not very good at absorbing or holding heat. Okay. So our balloon ended up popping. We're going to do something a little bit different now. We'll go ahead and relight the candle. Nice job. Thank you very much. This time we're going to use a water balloon. Can I beam that at the director? Yeah. Okay. Let's do it. <laughs> Now, because you're going to be holding this water balloon over the candle, do I need a, a we, raincoat we assume that it's going to pop. So in case it does, Jen, I'm going to move back a little bit. OK, go ahead. He's so nice. Thank you. Thank you. Hey, I hope I need a wardrobe, change of clothes. OK, just hold it right over here. Mm -hmm. And let's see if it pops. Go ahead. Hold it a little lower. Lower? Just go ahead and actually touch that flame. No. And it should pop, and it should <gasps> splash all over the place. Keep going. Oh. Nothing. Nothing at all. Unlike the air, water is very good at absorbing or holding heat. And you can see it's not popped on the bottom at all. 
So just like in the real world, the ocean in Antarctica is warmer than the air that's around it. Pretty cool, huh? Cool, Martin, thanks. Sure, not a problem. Oh, wow. And you didn't get soaked at all. I'm glad, because I would have had to have a word with you if that would have happened. <laughs> thanks, Martin. You're the mate. You know, it's always fun to open up the Brain Stew vault and check out some of our best experiments. Hey, that's my line. Of course, you know, I think they're all great. Anyway, keep that big brain of yours stewing and try some of those experiments at home. They're really fun. I'll see you next time. Bye. That's what we say, right guys? Anyway, all these experiments come from all... <laughs> Speaking of Lyft, my friend Gary performed a simple but awesome experiment on Lyft using only two options. You gotta try this, fresh. Speaking of Lyft, my friend Gary performed an awesome but simple experiment on Lyft. <laughs> wait, wait, wait.